So you're reading a copy of Women's Weekly magazine. And the copy is about five years old. And you're wondering, are there any germs on this? Where are you? The doctor's waiting room. And after about 20 minutes or half an hour after our allotted appointment time, the doctor will call us into the surgery. And what happens next is nearly too obvious to recount. The doctor will say, you know, what seems to be the problem? To which we reply, giving a list of our symptoms. The doctor makes a tentative diagnosis, writes a prescription, makes a referral, or simply says, if things get any worse, just make another appointment. And the whole thing is remarkably quick. It lasts an average of eight minutes. And that's it. That's the medical appointment of 2016. And fundamentally, it hasn't changed in millennia. And we may think the whole thing is very straightforward. But if we think the medical appointment is simple, we'd be dead wrong. Here's why. Medical error and misdiagnoses are the third leading cause of death, as reported in the United States. Only heart disease and cancer are bigger killers. I think that's worth repeating. Medical error kills. Medical error is not intentional, but I do believe that there is a deep deception among patients and members of the medical community over the complexities of the medical encounter. And I believe that it's this deception that in part perpetuates the pitfalls and the consequent harms that can result from the medical appointment. And in case you think that's an overstatement, let's go back to the consultation. Consider your doctor. By the time our doctor graduated from medical school, over half of what she learned was out of date. Medical knowledge is increasing at an exponential rate. Every 41 seconds, a new biomedical article is published. We expect our doctors to keep up to date with this information. It's impossible. We also expect our doctors to be empathic, to be courteous, perhaps even to remember who we are. But when we visit the doctor, we will be one of among 1,000 to around 2,500 patients in our doctor's care. And to better help you visualize those numbers, here in the Board Gosh Theater, there's capacity for about 2,200 people. So you know, the chances are we will know our doctor, we will recognize our doctor better than they will know us. Medicine requires doctors to switch between empathy, performing medical examinations, and also making consistently accurate diagnoses. But this is a, just a little bit like welcoming the neighbors into your house that you rarely see, giving them tea and biscuits, and making small talk with them, whilst also doing a cryptic crossword. Not even the hostess with the mostess can routinely pull that one off. So perhaps the surprise isn't that around 20% of consultations result in error. Perhaps the surprise is that an estimated 80% of them are correct. Yet doctors are increasingly faced with sanctions and lawsuits if they're found guilty of committing medical error. Here in Ireland, we are the second most medically litigious country in the world. And in America, doctors are increasingly practicing what's referred to as defensive medicine. And defensive medicine is leading to, for example, overscreening for cancer. Much of this is patient driven too. But it's estimated that th between three and 5% of future cases of cancer will be as a direct result of overscreening. Maybe it's no wonder that around half of American doctors regret 
their career choice. And similar numbers of British doctors, when recently polled, are burnt out. Medicine, as it's currently practiced, sets doctors up to fail. We expect our doctors to be godlike, to be infallible. They're just human. So what is really going on in the medical appointment? A host of disciplines is relevant to understanding how medicine works and how we can get it to work better. Sociology informs us that disparities exist between different demographic groups. It tells us that racial and class differences can occur even after point of access to care. Psychology explains that the cognitive demands of making consistently accurate medical diagnoses is beyond human computational power. And it also explains why face-to-face -face consultations act as an impediment to clinical accuracy. Developments in AI demonstrate that algorithms are beginning to outperform humans when it comes to diagnostics. IBM supercomputer Watson, that outcompeted the human contestants on the game show Jeopardy, has been doing the rounds at Sloan Kettering Medical Center in New York since 2011. So why is medicine so reticent about looking outside itself to knowledge embedded in different fields? As one of the world's top 10 most cited medical researchers and doctors, Eric Topol, has lamented, medicine is conservative to the point of being sclerotic. And Daniel Kahneman, Nobel laureate and cognitive scientist, has argued that overconfidence is endemic in medicine. And as we all know, conservatism and overconfidence is a really hazardous combination. <laughs> there should be a couple of other faces on that too, probably. I think there are two reasons for uh, medicine's continued conservatism. And the first reason is that a medical degree is still largely a training in biomedicine. So graduating doctors come away with very little appreciation for the importance of the human sciences, including psychology, but also of the humanities, the history of medicine, and developments in AI and robotics. And that's partly because they have an already overstuffed and an increasingly overstuffed medical curricula. But the second reason is the institutional insularity of medicine. Or as one doctor memorably told me, the culture of medicine is not to talk about its culture, not in any profound way. Return to the statistical medical error. Required reporting for medical error is still only mandatory in around half of all American states. So how do we ensure that medicine embraces the knowledge, the expertise of different fields of inquiry? I don't have all the answers. But I will make one suggestion, and it may surprise you. Philosophy. Philosophy is about taking a synoptic view of knowledge. And philosophers ask big, basic questions. And in many ways, a philosophical education is less an education in committing to memory the history of ideas or what various philosophers said. It's more about learning, cultivating a particular approach to knowledge, learning to ask questions and to criticize the answers, to analyze the answers. And this kind of philosophical acumen can be instilled in primary school age children, so age five or six years old, right the way up through education. If we want to embrace 
and to expedite the very best developments in medical research. We need graduates who are able to scale the medical ring fence. We need graduates with critical aptitude. And we need graduates who are able to bridge disciplinary divides and to see solutions wherever they may be. What will the future of the medical appointment look like? I don't have a crystal ball. They may not involve waiting rooms with out-of-date magazines. They may not involve doctors wearing stethoscopes and white coats. It's likely that developments in AI and robotics will increasingly fragment medical expertise. But one thing is for sure. If we want to reboot healthcare, and if we want to respond to a rapidly changing technological world, we will need a workforce that is adaptable and that is cognitively flexible. And for that, I think we need philosophy. Thank you. Want to be in the audience next time? Click here for tickets to InspireFest 2017.